Welcome, friends, to another edition of Economic Update, the weekly program devoted to the economic dimensions of our lives and those of our children. I'm your host, Richard Wolf. I want to remind you that Charlie Fabian is uh, ready and waiting to take whatever suggestions you have regarding future segments of this program. He's a volunteer whose work we appreciate much as we do the flow of information, suggestions, and comments that you've been sending his way. You can reach him via email at charlie.info438 at gmail.com. Once again, charlie.info438 at gmail.com. In today's program, we're going to be talking about the Baltimore Bridge disaster, about minimum wages in the United States, and about cities able, willing, and now having done successful rent reduction for the people living there, something that concerns Americans struggling with higher rents than we've ever seen in this country before. And in the second half of the program, we'll have an interview with Professor Jared Ball, uh, a professor of communications and Africana studies, who's going to be talking about black buying power and black capitalism here in the United States. Okay, let's get into it. I'm sure all of you have seen uh, the pictures that are really striking of that freighter loaded with containers that crashed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge uh, outside of Baltimore, uh, Maryland, a few weeks ago. It was a terrible disaster. There was loss of life. There was terrible damage. And there was real destruction of trade routes and schedules and economic losses and, and all the rest. A genuine catastrophic accident uh, that happened here in the United States. And it led people to comment yet again that much of the infrastructure of the United States, the roads, the highways, the bridges, the tunnels, all those things without which a modern economy cannot exist, why they are so poorly maintained, why they are so poorly attended to. In the case of the uh, bridge in Baltimore, everyone wants to know, why were there no barriers around the pillars that held the bridge up? Why was no attention given to these super large cargo ships that have trouble navigating various rivers and bridges, which were built when shipping was much smaller and much less heavy and so forth? Why are there not reviews of all the old bridges, especially when the government of the United States has a ranking that indicates that tens of thousands of bridges in the United States are not in decent repair, are dangerous, and have been for a long time. In short, the real question here is not so much about this particular accident with our infrastructure, but why our infrastructure is such a problem. And I want to address that question, mostly because it isn't addressed by much of the mainstream media. And here you will not be surprised to hear me say, the problem is our capitalist system. And I can explain it very concretely. In our capitalist system, we arrange that government, government has much of the responsibility for maintaining our infrastructure, our roads, our bridges, our tunnels, and all of that. And we therefore say that the politicians who sit at the top of our governments are there to make sure it, it works. The problem is that those politicians whose job is, is to make it work, they also depend on votes, otherwise they can't get in to office. And they depend on money, because otherwise they can't get in to office. You need money to get the votes 
to get into office? Well, the mass of people provide the mass of the votes. And rich people and corporations provide the money with which to approach and persuade the people to vote. So our politicians need to pander to the people with money and power, rich and corporate leaders, because that's where the money comes from to make it into office, particularly governor, senator, and the higher offices. That's the number one goal. If you get that, then you can do the PR that'll help you get the votes. And how do you make sure that the people at the top give you the money? Don't tax them. And how do you make sure that the mass of people give you the votes? Well, in our country, same story. Don't tax them. We've made a politics out of don't tax them. The Republican Party lives and breathes, promising, whether they deliver it or not, to cut your taxes. And the Democrats are so taken and horrified by what that means that they join the Republicans most of the time. So the problem for the politicians is this. How do you maintain the infrastructure of a country which is expensive, costs money? If you can't tax the mass of the people enough to do it. Well, the politicians learned long ago, you better maintain some things or else the people will stop voting for you in a day. The schools can't close. The roads can't close. The hospitals can't close. The police can't stop being there. The firefighters either, and so on. So there are a whole bunch of things that politicians cannot avoid spending money and therefore taxing either the corporations or the mass of people or both, and thereby losing political support. But in American politics, the politicians long ago discovered what they can do. They can avoid raising taxes. They can pretend in front of the audience and the TV camera, I didn't raise your taxes. No increase in taxes. Knowing full well that by not raising the taxes, they won't have the money to inspect the bridges and fix them. And they can get away with that. Because if you don't fix the bridge in the supportive ways needed, it doesn't show up for another two to four to six to nine years. Same thing with many other aspects of infrastructure. You can defer maintenance, that's what it's called. Defer repair, defer the needed safety adjustments. No one will quite notice. You'll make sure no one does. You'll fire any whistleblower who says otherwise. And you won't have to raise the taxes or borrow the money, which also makes you look bad. And so politicians have done it. There's no mystery why we don't fix those bridges. We don't, no mystery why we allow these accidents to happen. It's the fault of this system of having a politics dependent on rich corporations and the people they make wealthy on the one hand for the money, wanting not to tax them because they won't like you and they won't give you the money if you tax them. So you can't tax them, but how are you going to function delivering what the society needs? You deliver everything that will be noticed and you hide what might be not noticed. And if the bridge only falls down five years later, you'll be gone. You'll be on to the next higher office as a politician. That'll be left to whoever comes after you. And in our system, we don't care about that. Or at least the people in power don't care about who comes later into power. Is that an irrational way to run a society? You bet. But it's our way. And we're not going to allow it to change because we know that ours is the best way, no matter how horrible the accident. And for those of you that are bean counter type economists, let me assure you, maintenance is way cheaper than repairing the accident after it happens. It would have been much less of a tax burden to maintain the Francis Scott Key Bridge than to now go through all the losses, all the costs, of rebuilding the bridge. 
It's an irrationality of market-based capitalism, and we ought to face it rather than pay the heavy price for not doing that. My next update is a shout out to the town of Tukwila, Washington. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing it. It's a small city outside of Seattle. Why do I call for us to recognize it? Because they have the highest minimum wage in the United States in Tukwila, Washington. $20.29 per hour is the minimum wage for most of the employees there. Even mentioned by the New York Times on March 29th of 2024. It's a testimony to what can be done if there's a concerted effort to do it. Tukwila is doing just fine with that minimum wage. Are there some small businesses that go out of business because they can't afford? Absolutely. But there are lots of other small businesses that are helped because the higher minimum wage puts money in the pocket of Tukwila residents to spend more on local small businesses than they otherwise could. It cuts both ways. And by the way, if you want to help small business, help them. Give them subsidies. Let them compete against the big businesses. They don't mind the big businesses when minimum wages are raised much of the time because they know it'll help them destroy small businesses that'll go out of business and the big ones can take over the market from them. Big businesses can raise their prices more easily than small ones. Big businesses can find savings elsewhere more easily than small ones. Don't confuse the minimum wage question and small business with the fight between big and small businesses. We can have small businesses if we help them have a level playing field with the big business. That's where the problem really lies. Finally, I want to tell you about a law in the state of New York and what it made possible in the hopes that many of you will do the same thing elsewhere. There was a law passed in New York State in 1974, uh, and it allows for a rent guidelines board to come into existence if an emergency housing situation is declared. Here's what that means. Very simple. It means that the vacancy rate, the percentage of apartments that are empty, falls below 5% of all apartments. If that happens, it's an emergency. By the way, Right now, as I'm speaking to you, the vacancy rate in New York and Boston is well below 5%. They have emergencies, as do many communities across the United States, large and small. But one took advantage of this law because in 1991, if I have my data right, or maybe a bit later, that law was extended from New York City and its suburbs to the whole state. And one city, Kingston, New York, about 90 miles north of New York City, population 25,000, set up such a board. And the the, uh, Rent Guidelines Board, they determined there was an emergency. Less than 5% of apartments were vacant. So they did what they have the legal right to do. They cut all rents by 15% for the first year of their discussion. That was appealed by landlords who were outraged And they went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court of the state of New York decided in favor of the tenants in Kingston, and they had a rent cut of 15%. Can you do something about rents? You bet. The people of Kingston did it. You can do it too. These laws are created to allow that to be done, to deal with a rent emergency. And lest you cry for the landlord, Let me also point out that in the six or seven years before all this happened in Kingston, rents had risen by over 50% in Kingston. Landlords had been doing great. Now it was their turn to help the tenants do great. They didn't want to. The tenants are the majority. They took it to court and they won. Can you do something about high rents? Yes. It's not whether you can. It's really a political question. Will you? 
and those who share your situation of renting, which is what the majority of Americans do. We've come to the end of the first half of today's economic update. Please stay with us. We have a really interesting interview with Professor Jared Ball when we return. Welcome back, friends, to the second half of today's economic update. I am very proud to bring to our microphones and to our cameras Jared Ball. He is professor of communication and Africana studies at Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland, and author of The Myth and Propaganda of Black Buying Power. Ball also hosts the podcast I Mix What I Like. He's a co-founder of Black Power Media, which can be found at blackpowermedia.org, and he can be found at I Mix What I Like on most social media. He has done decades of emancipatory journalism, and that too can be found at I Mix What I Like.org. So first of all, welcome, Jared. I hope you don't mind if I call you Jared so that we can get to the business of talking about what needs some discussion. No, right on. It's an honor, and I thank you and and your your staff and your your audience for hosting me. Good. All right, let me start. The phrase black buying power, and more broadly, the phrase black capitalism, has been offered as a path to economic and social justice for African Americans. Can you tell us a little bit about these concepts and what you think of them uh, in that context? Well, the short answer, starting working backwards, is I think they're horrible, and they are concepts that have been imposed by design by the ruling elite to discourage Black populations from radically organizing for political power. So buying power, as I'm sure you and others are aware, has its own history in association with cost of living surveys. Uh, in an attempt to manage the the sort of pressure point at which those who rule could pay their workers without the workers earning enough to not be workers, but earning enough to buy what they are producing, thereby keeping the economy going. And out of that came, uh, again, cost of living surveys, buying power, and buying power as a subset as a concept. Over time, particularly after the Second World War, and then really, again, during the Nixon administration as a subset of the Black capitalist ethic, and promotional campaign, Black buying power became weaponized and targeted as a concept to Black communities, again, as a subset of the Black capitalist mythology and ethic uh, and propaganda to discourage Black people from being critical of capitalism as an economy and thinking that they can find their salvation in it by just increasing things like, quote unquote, financial literacy, so-called behavior, consumption behavior, and so on. But in reality, it was and has been a tactic to get Black people to walk away from critically analyzing the society and radically organizing it out of existence. You know, it's interesting. It it stimulates me right away. I've always admired the way in America, more than in Europe, you could change the identification of people from workers to consumers. You stop calling them workers. It's the same people, but you call them consumer. But of course, that reorients their way of thinking about themselves in a way to discourage transforming the work experience and all that that means. Now it's about, you know, being smart enough to go to the discount house rather than buying it at Sears or something else. Amazing to watch. Okay, let me let me switch. There's been quite a bit of attention to something developing in Atlanta called Cop City. What is that? And what do you have to say about it? Well, Cop City, and I I would defer to my my, uh, Black Power Media comrade, Kamal Franklin, and and others like community movement builders and others down there doing a lot of the hardcore organizing and struggling on this particular topic. But Cop City is essentially an attempt to develop a training facility to prepare the police to do what Malcolm X has said is their role, to do locally what the military does internationally, and that is to police and suppress 
threatening organizational efforts among labor, among colonized communities, among Black and Latin and indigenous populations, come up with another excuse to further expand that apparatus uh, and to fund it. So, the, and by the way, as my, my other comrade, Renee Johnston, has been doing a lot of great work on lately, cop cities are, 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 are emerging all over the country. And almost every state, uh, overwhelmingly, uh, I think 47 at least, at this point was, was what her research is showing, have some version of this cop city. So the one in Atlanta was, is, is expected to be uh, somewhere around the cost of $100 million. There's one being planned he, uh, not far from me in Baltimore. That's going to be three times that cost, which is, again, part of some. It actually reminds me of something that I read in, in 2018, where uh, the military, the U.S. military, was doing war games in advance of what they thought was going to be the coming rise of a Generation Z that was going to realize it wasn't going to get what it was promised. And instead of, of course, redistributing resources and, and goods and services, the idea was, well, we'll just prepare militarily for an uprising. Well, this is in effect what I think these cop cities are meant for, that the idea is uh, exploitation and oppression is not going to stop. Movements uh, that, that are, are born it, it sort of uh, dialectically as a response to oppression are going to emerge. So why not prepare uh, from the perspective of the ruling elite for the military response to that, as opposed to anything progressive, radical, or dare I say revolutionary that would just simply redistribute the goods and services and the wealth we all help to produce. So by the way, even going back to your previous point about the the, the labeling of consumer, and part of what my, my work is, is meant to, to talk about as it's directed at, at the Black American population, although there are versions of this target all manner of populations, is that there has been an attempt to redefine consumer in the relationship of, in, in the process of consumption as somehow invaluable or immature or uh, somehow inferior into the process, when in reality, especially in a society like this, where the economy is at least 70% based on consumption, consumption in the consumer should be more valorized and valued and appreciated and encouraged with the idea of being, of course, that the wealth produced from that consumption be better redistributed as opposed to accumulating ever increasingly to a, to a tiny elite. So that ability to, to as again, Malcolm X said, had the, the United States had perfected the science of image making is a big part of the process that allows for this exploitation to continue. All right, I want to build on these two comments that you made, because if you look at the one hand at the t attempt to, how shall I put it, ideologically or psychologically demobilizing the African-American community, or by extension, the working class, or on the other hand, repressing it with the police and the military, do you agree with some folks who believe that we are in a different place now than we were as recently as 20 or 30 years ago in the following sense, that those things are going on that you've just described, but they're now going on not in the ascending phase of the American empire, but on the contrary, in the descending phase, that there's now an element of desperation in the way that this is being done because even though it's not put in these terms, there is a developing sense across the society, a sense of doom and gloom, a sense that somehow the losses in wars like Vietnam or Afghanistan or Iraq or now uh, uh, Ukraine and so on, that these are emblems or signs of a decline that make an already quasi-rebellious African-American community become more scary because as things unravel, we may expect from them a level of pushback that then begins to unravel the whole system. Is, is there anything like that going on that strikes you? Well, yes. So because I watched your show and, and followed your work and the work of your colleagues here for a while, I, I kind of get the picture that 
that there is a, a concern among the ruling elite of this society that that that, that their power is, is is waning in the world. But because because my approach, for instance, to my work is 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 largely a combination of Africana and media studies as opposed to economics proper per se. A lot of what I do in my work is to look at the way economic ideas and responses to them are messaged and communicated. And because I've had been encouraged or by design of, of my profession studied the history of U.S. mass communication research, what becomes almost immediately clear is that those in power in the society have for the longest time worked ardently to, to sort of collapse the gap between the need of a, ultimately a handful of people to exploit and rule so many. In other words, to collapse the, the numeric in, inequality that they suffer, the, the lack of numbers, with the fact that they can exaggerate their influence through messaging and through narrative dominance, through manipulation of symbols, and even as we were just discussing, definition of terms and identities, et cetera. So a lot of what I am seeing, and at least interpreting it, is sort of uh, even in connection with the, with the recent pandemic, that as more people started to raise questions around well, wait a minute, how is society actually working? How does the economy actually work? Who are, who are valued and, and unvalued in the economy? More propaganda seemed to, I, I didn't do a, pro, a proper study per se, but it seemed to be that there was an uptick in the propaganda promoting versions of capitalism, Western-styled uh, imperialist-based democracy, and certainly targeting Black communities, Black capitalist ideas as solutions and saying, don't, don't raise too many questions about the creation of wealth that's easily redistributed in the moment of crisis. Don't raise questions about the actual standing of the U.S. economy in the world. And don't look at how other countries and other formations in the world are developing as a response to the dollar, the, 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 uh, dollar diplomacy and, and its impact in the world, so to speak. Just look to the, as I'm describing, the mythologies of, of capitalism, black capitalism, for your solutions. And so, yeah, so I do feel like as this society, as those in power struggle to maintain their power, there is an uptick in the propaganda and really the psychological warfare that they're waging against the rest of us in a variety of ways. You know, I, I, again, uh, very stimulating what you're saying. It reminds me of a, a trip I took to Europe three years ago and the jealousy, I, I use that word advisedly, the jealousy of capitalists in Europe who feel that the Americans, whom they look down on in lots of ways, were geniuses compared to them in, in what they call the molding of public opinion. That For them, that's half the explanation for the superiority of American over European capitalism. You were able, you the American looking at me, you were able to do that in your country. We can't do that here. We we have too much opposition. It's too deeply rooted. We can't get it. We can't. Every time we do something, the socialist or the communist or somebody is undoing it in the newspaper every day. And and you don't have that. And that that's your genius. Well, we're running out of time. So let me end with what you just said. You've been a, a journalist in the broadest sense of the word, a, a, a thinker, a, 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 an expositor. How do you look at America today, the phenomena, this rerun of Biden versus Trump and the, the whole effort of this country to survive a declining global position? What's your sense of it? Well, uh, similar to what has been said or alluded to, that the ruling elite are struggling. So really the way I'm looking at it is that the return to Biden versus Trump is, is speaks both to the decline of, of that this country is struggling to, to resist, but also, unfortunately, the insufficient levels of organization among those of us on the left to take advantage of this appropriately and to intervene more effectively in taking advantage of this, this struggle that the ruling elite are having. And, I, and again, I see this as largely the result of a media environment that has been designed and developed with 
levels of meticulousness that I don't think many of us are encouraged to appreciate. And certainly I would have appreciated had it not become sort of a core focus of my professional life over the last 20 years, that so much of what we are encouraged to believe of as news or in particular entertainment is really a counterinsurgency psychological warfare effort designed again in literally as Yasha Levine, whose work I'm using in one of my classes this, this semester, uh, has demonstrated, was literally developed in the war zones of, of Korea and Vietnam and brought home here to the United States with the specific idea of targeting Black Americans who have always been seen, with, obviously, as a potential threat to, to those in power. And I do think it's interesting to note that if you go back and look at the, the newspapers of the day, they refer to Nat Turner and his crew as insurgents in the same way they refer to, to people fighting for their own land in, in Iraq or Palestine, which I think is fascinating. And it's, that, it's on that basis that I think that they've continued to work to suppress efforts in those spaces and here in the United States to, to develop a radical and critical consciousness that unites with other uh, people in struggle and becomes uh, an organized threat to power here. But so, so that's what I think that that's what I think is going on a little bit. And what I think we need to, to work harder to, to struggle against. That is the, the counterinsurgency psychological warfare that's targeting us and making it so much more difficult here for us to build around the analysis that you and your comrades do and, and that others uh, of us and other formations are trying to, to work with as well. Well, I want you to come back. I want to continue this conversation so we can address all of those points that you made. Really, thank you very much, Professor Jared Ball. And uh, to all of you in my audience, I hope you found this as interesting as I did. And as always, I look forward to speaking with you again next week. <laughs>